Welcome to part two in this build series. If you haven't seen part one already, then click up here and watch that first. I also wondered if my thermal compound wasn't performing well. I tried a high performance thermal paste, but unsurprisingly it didn't make any noticeable improvement. And just for the heck of it, I tried this massive CPU cooler next. So I'll put the results of all those tests up on screen for comparison. The summary though is yes the TEG units did output more power with both of the CPU heat sinks, but unfortunately it didn't triple or quadruple the power output which is really where this project needs to be. At the moment I think my best heat sink option, one that isn't too expensive and I can get my hands on a lot of them, is this heat sink right here so I'm going to stick with that. So how do I plan on making more power then? Well, since I can't cool the cold side down any further than using this heat sink, I need to make the hot side hotter. Now the only way to do that is to move the TEG units off the boilers, which is limiting the peak temperature to 100 degrees C, and move them onto the chimney here. Now there is a risk of heating up the TEG units beyond the temperature threshold of 150 C. But at this point, YOLO. I just need to try it and see what happens. I machined out this alloy with a slot cut into it. At the end of the slot I'll place a drop of thermal paste to ensure I get an accurate temperature reading with my temperature probe. My goal here was to try and accurately measure the hot side of the TEG. So the surface temperature of the hot side of the TEG peaked at around 202 degrees in this test. So it looks like there's about a 40 degree temperature difference between the surface of the chimney and the hot side of the TEG. So I've machined out this grid on a piece of 6mm thick aluminium. And the purpose of this is to hopefully limit the heat transfer to the TEG unit so that we don't exceed the 150 degree threshold. So I ended up making and testing three different designs and I got some very interesting results. The first design peaked at around 220 C, the second design peaked at around 175, and the last design also peaked at 175. Now although these have very different uh, surface areas, the temperature was the same. And what I believe is going on here is most of the heat that has been absorbed is actually the radiating heat off the front of the chimney, not the actual metal that's making contact with the chimney. So if my new theory is correct and I can power my tags just from the radiating heat alone, that means I could use something like this alloy bar mount all my tags on this bar and then have the bar floating just off the chimney. Now this opens up a brand new door for me as well because if I mount the bar to the chimney and have it so that I can adjust how far or close it is to the chimney that means I can also control the temperature that the tags are receiving and that means I can fine tune the system much better than just slapping them on there and hoping for the best.
So this is the bar that I've made up that's going to uh, capture the radiating heat from the stove and transfer it to the tegs. This bar also mounts all the heat sinks I'll be using. Now let me explain what I've got going on here. At this end I've got a captive nut which allows me to adjust the bar and at this end I've also got a captive nut but it can slide back and forth and that's to allow thermal expansion when this thing gets toasty. So I'm at the stage where I've wired all my tegs together. So I'm using nine in total, and they're wired three in series, which make up a group. And then I've got three groups wired in parallel. That should give me the best voltage range for my application. Now I have also included a temperature probe over here, which will be attached later on to this little temperature display, which will be far more convenient for monitoring the temperature than using uh, an external temperature monitor like I was before. Now things to consider when wiring, everything's going to be exposed to a lot of heat. So where possible, use things like uh, high temperature silicone wire, fiberglass sleeving for added heat shielding. Now the connections between the tegs were too short to put any sleeving over, so I needed a brush on insulator. And really the only thing I could think of using was silicone gasket maker, uh, which is obviously a automotive product. It's designed to be in the engine bay and exposed to a lot of heat. Now yes, it does look like a toddler went crazy with a melted Smurf everywhere, but it does provide good electrical insulation as well as being fairly temperature resistant as well. So I've got my heat sinks and I've got all my tegs pre-wired. Now it's time to mount everything. Now there is a possibility that there'll be a temperature difference between the top and the bottom of the alloy bar because one end's a lot closer to the fire so we'll be monitoring that. And you might have noticed that since I'm no longer mounting the tegs on the side of the boilers I've added these heat guards to stop anyone burning themselves on it. So we've got everything up to temperature. The top of the bar is currently just below 120 C and the bottom of the bar closest to the fire is just over 150. So I've got an open circuit voltage of 12.8 volts. And with a 16 ohm load, just under 10 volts. So what does that mean in real terms? Well, let's find out. I had a 16 ohm load and I had 10 volts across it. That means we were producing 6.25 watts of power. Yes, finally did it finally producing enough power to actually be useful and do something. Now all I've got to do is work on a voltage regulation circuit. For the PCB Gerber files and component list, check out the link in the video description. The circuit is designed around the LM317 voltage regulator, which might at first seem like a poor choice over, say, a buck converter with regards to efficiency. But because the amount of power being generated by the TIGs is somewhat limited, when a load is drawing power, the voltage from the TIGs is pulled down, which ultimately means the circuit has acceptable efficiency for this application. The input voltage range is 6 to 20 volts, and the output is 5 volts up to 1.5 amp. You might have noticed on the circuit board there's a two pin header uh, labelled LED. That connects to an LED I've got mounted on the enclosure here. And the idea of this LED is that it turns on uh, when enough power has been generated to start charging. So I'm now at the stage I'm wiring in my USB socket. 
So in a USB cable you'll have four wires, the red and black are positive and negative, and the white and green are the data wires. Now you might think we don't need these because it's just a phone charger. Well we do actually need these. Uh, we actually need to twist the two wires together, dead short them, and that's to let the phone know that it's hooked up to a charger so that it will accept power. If you don't do this, if you plug in your phone it might not charge at all. So I've chosen to have my charger on all the time, but you could add a power switch to turn it off if you so desired. And the LED indicator, as you can see, it's on. That's letting me know that we're starting to produce enough power I could charge something from it. And the switch over here turns on or off my temperature sensing probe. And it's not very easy to see in the daylight, bit of a downfall of this particular one. But uh, it's letting me know that uh, we're running at 63 degrees C at the moment. All right, here goes the moment of truth. Let's see if I can charge my phone. Woohoo, look at that. See that, see that up there? It's charging, yes! So now that I've finished building my stove, is that it for the end of the project? Well, no, I'd love to actually continue to improve the design and evolve it over time. So where to from here? Well, full disclosure, I've thoroughly tested this and used it on several occasions. And on one particular occasion, I loaded up the stove with some really hot burning wood, walked away for a couple minutes, and when I returned, the tegs were over 200 degrees C and I toasted them. Now, to be clear, this was operator error. This was my fault. It does highlight an issue though. In a survival situation, ideally you need everything to be bulletproof, and currently this isn't. The tags I used have a relatively low peak temperature when compared to others on the market. There are far better options out there, tags that can handle well over 300 degrees C. The only catch is often quality tags demand a price to match, and when you need nine of them, well that adds up really quick. So I'm going to shop around and see what my best options are. I'd also like to explore improved cooling options, perhaps even liquid cooling might be possible, who knows? So let me know if you have any interesting ideas to improve on this design in the comment section down below, and don't forget to hit that subscribe button and hit the bell notification so that you don't miss any future updates on this build, or perhaps you'd like to check out some of my other videos on my channel as well. I want to give a quick shout out to Surplus Tools in Rotorua, New Zealand. Uh, they are a great bunch of guys, I've been going there for years for my power tools and machinery. They helped get me in touch with DuraWeld that supplied the welder and uh, easy swap for the gas bottle. But they also hooked me up with one of their uh, auto darkening welding helmets and also a pair of beautiful soft leather TIG welding gloves as well. So thank you very much for that guys. So thank you very much for watching again and I'll see you in the next video. Bye for now.